Okay, hello everyone. Uh, <laughs> yes, there's a teddy bear behind me. We're in my other room here because I realize I don't really need to start off every video with like a random update and like things that I'm doing right now. <laughs> but I just tried to refilm my tier ranking video of, of ranking the books that I read in 2022. I filmed it a couple days ago initially and filmed for like two and a half hours. It was far too long and I wasn't really prepared. Like there were a couple of books in a series that I just kept mixing up and not, not knowing like which one I liked better essentially. I felt at the time that it was kind of a mess, but I just tried to film again and I realized I actually like what I say more in that first try. But that's gonna take a bit to edit and to go through and condense as much as possible because no one is gonna watch a tier ranking. Literally, I watched tier ranking videos like this past week. People rate like 60, 70, 100 books and their ranking videos are like 30 minutes, 30, maybe, maybe close to 40. And I'm like, how, how am I gonna get, how am I gonna, sorry, my Discord's going off. How am I gonna get a two and a half hour video down to something like that and I even talk about way less books, like 44 books compared to 100. I'm gonna work on that, okay? I have no idea when it will be coming, but we're filming this while uh, I'm the only one home. <laughs> Since for that video, I was like doing a screen, re screen recording and like this was the setup, we're just staying here and doing my uh, favorites and like standout films that I watched in 2022. Uh, first time watches, and I have a list here in front of me on my letterbox that is the movies. The sh yes, movies, but also a couple things represent shows. And uh, we're just going in chronological order of having watched them. 20, I have 20 things here that honestly was like kind of hard to figure out because I feel like ultimately there weren't that many things that I watched that were like new favorites of mine, which was disappointing. And... I talk, I'll talk about it more in my goals video for 2023, but I do wish that there were more standout things that I watched and read in 2022. I wouldn't say that this, that last year felt like mid. It was like between mid and great. So it was just good, I guess. <laughs> that That's an accurate description. Yeah, <laughs> you know, good. But I I wanted more things even if I watched things that were great, even if I read things that were great, I wanted more that I was like really into and were new favorites and that I'm like more passionate about. In chronological order of having watched them, first we have The Crucible. I have this one. I don't have to put the poster up because I own it. From 1996, directed by Nicholas Heitner. Heitner? Hitner? H-Y-T-N-E-R. And I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 on Letterboxd. I clicked the heart. Ultimately, The Crucible is just so good. I'm not exactly sure what this movie was doing with certain decisions, but let's face it, I love Winona Ryder, and The Crucible was one of my favorite books that I read this year, and the combination just really worked. I think also the, the story overall has so much that you can talk about and discuss. I'm not gonna get into it really here. Also, have a very long review. Uh, I kind of rant about it a little bit, but that more so has to do with like the characters. Uh, yeah, so I do have a review. I will link any review that I have like in the description. If you don't know what The Crucible is about, it's an adaptation of the play by Arthur Miller. And this was inspired by, based on the Salem Witch Trials, which is where the story takes place at that, the 1690s? Oh, it literally says 1692 on Letterboxd. A Salem resident attempts to frame her ex-lover's wife for being a witch in the middle of the 19th of the 19 of the 1692 witchcraft trials. That's what Letterboxd says, but that's so nondescript. So, um, it has to do with, oh my god, wait, I love this image here on the back of an owner writer. <laughs> look at the way she's looking, she's definitely looking at John Proctor, let's face it. Look at that. Look at the love in her eyes. Um, but also, like, what is going through 
Abby's mind. Abby? Abigail Williams? Yes. Abby's such an interesting character. She is the ringleader of a group of girls who were caught dancing in the woods and and then they claim that it is because of witchcraft. In the accusations upon them, they accuse others in the community in the very, very small town. It supersedes from there. It just explodes. I probably have a Goodreads review also since this is based on a book that I read this year. I'll link I'll link any reviews that I have for anything <laughs> in the description, regardless of if it's the movie or the source material. The Green Knight from 2021, directed by David Lowry. I gave it a four out of five stars and I got this regular Blu-ray edition, but it has a slip cover, which is really nice. And I will say that this is a standout also because of the source material, the epic poem that this is based on by an unknown person. We don't know who wrote the poem. I keep saying this, but I need more epic poetry in my life. And I do own, I'm pretty sure, at least a couple of things that I can read that are epic poems. So I'm gonna maybe try to get to those this year. And Sir Gawain, okay, okay, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is the title of the poem, but the movie is just called The Green Knight. This movie does take some liberties with the premise, but ultimately I did appreciate them and liked this, I mean, it is a legend in itself, the tale, and it, it really felt like that. So I liked this very otherworldly fairy tale quality that the movie had, but also being like an Arthurian fantasy movie, if that makes sense. Just because there are like fantastical things that happen. Uh, of course, Morgan, Sir Gawain's mother, is a witch. And the Green Knight himself is a sort of magical being. But then you have these like heroic and chivalrous sensibilities from Arthurian legend and romances and such. So um, I love this mix of things. Oh, the, literally also the production design of this is fantastic. Like I don't think enough people were talking about this when it came out. Like in, in people's wrap-ups of 2021, it, you know, like a year ago when people were talking about movies that they watched the year before, the Green Knight did not show, enough, show up nearly enough times, in my opinion, even though I, at the time of watching it, I did have conflicting thoughts because of changes that were made, but I do think I appreciate them more and that was, that had to do with me having like super high expectations for this. Not only because I thought it looked fantastic because of the trailers, but then also in reading the source material, I ended up loving it and loving the language of it as well, which I think is very well like reflected in in the production design of this. It's just absolutely beautiful. Did I, I did talk about, okay, yes, okay. I will link in the description and in the card. I did talk about The Crucible and The Green Knight in a video where I was talking, I was talking about both like the source materials and the adaptations. Those obviously happened like pretty soon after I actually read and watched these things. So I, I, I will put that in the description and in the card for people to see in the moment thoughts, you know? <gasps> okay, next. You guys, this is such an underrated movie. Truly a stand, I mean, obviously it's in this video, but truly a standout. Um, I'm gonna look up how to pronounce this. It is in Spanish. Oh, this is like a long... Okay, the first two words. Cría cuervos y te sacarán los okay. ojos. Okay. <laughs> Cría... She like really made the R sound a certain way. Cría cu cuervos. Cuervos. Cría cuervos. From 1976. Directed by Carlos Sora. Sora. This is in the Criterion Collection, okay, but it's DVD only and I need it to be upgraded to Blu-ray because I need it in my collection. It was so good. Um, I gave it a 4 out of 5 stars, but honestly, I can see myself liking it even more on a rewatch. I also love the, the cover is so intriguing to me. This is a sort of coming of age story about this young girl, Anna, Anna, probably, Anna, probably pronounced like that, Anna, who has got to be like eight very young elementary school age. It's also the same 
little actress in what is that called the spirit of the beehive and it also stars geraldine chaplin as their mother there are like flashbacks to their parents but they're raised by their aunt and grandmother that's who they're living with so you see like flashbacks to the life that they used to have before they came to live with their aunt anna is very fascinated by death it's very it's just so interesting to see this curiosity and that she has also the connection of the events in her life with death because I mean being an orphan obviously both her mother and father are dead it's hard to talk about because there isn't much of a plot it's very slice of life in that way but I I just loved it so much and I need I need an I need an upgrade thank you and also like I just watched the movie I don't it was on the Criterion channel, but I don't know if it had the supplements available as well. It is available, by the way, to watch on the Criterion channel as I'm filming right now. This month of January, you can watch it. Okay, then we have Bright Star from 2009, directed by Jane Campion. Four and a half out of five. Like, I do think it was like a little bit slow, but I would say... This is a, this is a big thing to say. I would say that Bright Star is my favorite movie that I watched in 2022. It's just so good. Okay, the it's about um, John Keats. Well, okay, no, it's more so about Fanny, who they ended up being a couple, but she was just like this young woman who lived in the same sort of area as John Keats. They fall in love and are in this relationship John Keats was a poet, so he's also working on his poems at the same time, and Fanny is just her sort of independent self. I mean, she she lives with her family, but obviously, because that's the way things were, but she also was very fashion forward. She like made her own clothes, which is very well represented in this movie. One of the reasons why it stands out to me is just because the production design, particularly the costumes, are superb. Like top tier, this is what I'm looking for in costume dramas, in period pieces. Obviously this is very specific to the early 1800s, but it still like showed the exact styles and fashion of the time and how Fanny, like there are a couple of characters who are like, Fanny's hat is weird, <laughs> essentially. That's just because it doesn't stick to what was like norm in society at that time. I keep saying it's beautiful, but that is because in the way that it's filmed, it looks beautiful, the costuming is beautiful. There's also a lot of like nature scenes because there's a lot of like nature imagery in his work and that is shown in the film. Bright Star is also the name of one of his poems that was dedicated to Fanny. It's just a beautiful story. It's also very sad though. There's like one one moment where Fanny like breaks down and I I also broke down. I'm also hoping since the piano is in the Criterion collection, since the Power of the Dog is in the Criterion collection. Are those the only two movies? No. She has more no no no. Oh my god, what am I saying? It needs to be, it, anyway, it needs to be in the Criterion collection. What is the other one? Sweetie? Sweetie's in it. An Angel at My Table. Let's go. Bright Star. <laughs> Bright Star. And then I have Downton Abbey. I just added, like, because the finales of each season is, like, a special, they're listed on Letterboxd. I have Downton Abbey, the finale of the show, as a favorite. It says 2015 because that's when the show ended. 4.5 out of 5 stars. This ultimately represents Downton Abbey, which has become one of my favorite shows. Honestly, it was kind of slow at first, but it, I watched the the first episode. I'm trying to remember. I know I talked about it a little bit in a video last year in like January. I think I watched the, the pilot a handful of months before, perhaps. Like I think maybe it was like the fall of 2021 and it just like didn't hit the way I wanted it to. And then I started it out, I rewatched the pilot and continued with the show. And it just, it just became everything, okay? Again, period piece. I have also since like become kind of obsessed with like the 1910s in particular, like that style, like Art Nouveau. 
in particular, which kind of is from like the late 1890s into like, you know, starts to merge a bit with Art Deco in the 20s. Like just this period of time, I've just become obsessed with the aesthetics, with the colors, with the architecture. And also, okay, also, <laughs> I like almost immediately, not immediately, but like pretty soon after finishing Downton Abbey, I like didn't know what to watch at one point and I literally just started the show over. I just started watching the pilot again and it was so interesting seeing it for the first time after finishing the show because there are such subtle changes that happen episode to episode that you don't realize like how much the passage of time is being represented in the design and in, in the overall production with the set, with the, I mean, I, I noticed it more with the costumes because I'm more interested in costumes and the costuming of shows, like that's something that I pay attention to more, um, I feel like, is it? I'm saying that, but then I immediately questioned it after I finished that sentence. It's easy, it's easy for background things, for set things to kind of blend in because it is setting up the scene. I guess is what I'm saying. So it's easy to just see like the entrance of one of the characters and be like, oh, look at what she's wearing. Whereas if you're not noticing the background as much, sometimes that means that it's doing a good job because it is just the setting. Well, okay, it's not just the setting. Sometimes it also represents the characters very well, just in the same way as costuming can. So anyway, uh, but there were like things in the in the pilot that I noticed that they don't have electricity yet. And they even like were talking about it a little bit. And it, it, I had not even thought about how throughout the rest of the show after they, they do get electricity at some point, And then there's there's no longer they're not using candles anymore. And it's just like, it details like that that went like completely over my head the first time that I was watching it, unless something is made more uh, of a big deal in in the lives of the characters it is maybe like more of a moment within the show or is something that's prevalent for one of the characters and I just think very similar to the way that I like love Brian's Head Revisited and find Brian's Head Revisited so interesting this is another great example of the cha changing society and changing times where this starts before World War One, and it goes into the 20s like that's a long time with so many significant changes. And especially for British society where you're having these characters that are lords and ladies that have these estates that they run to now a little bit more of like modern society starting to show itself and these titles not meaning as much anymore and families selling their estates, having them be free for more people not them you know they're not homes for these families necessarily anymore they don't own a lot of the land of that area because they're selling it to families and creating creating more of a society around the actual people in the town rather than those who have the title and who are of higher wealthier society and I love I just I love the journeys that some of the characters go on I've also been trying to get my mom to watch it she wants to watch the um I've only seen the first movie so far it's not a favorite I did I did obviously watch it after I watched the show but I decided to just put the the finale here of the show in this list because I much preferred the actual show over the movie the the movie is very like fan servicey and very like very mid in my opinion it's like it's fine it's nothing memorable and especially if you don't already know the characters or have the attachment it's not gonna be that great it's not gonna mean a whole lot to you my mom wants to see that but i'm trying to get her to watch the show instead or both she can she can watch the movie first and then i'll be like mm, but the show <laughs> You need to understand things better. Let's watch the show. And then I have Spirited Away. This was actually such a surprise. I'm not like an anime person. And honestly, there are like certain images that I've seen of this movie that is just so off-putting <laughs> in my opinion to me. There's like there's like the the image of like the pigs eating. And I'm just like, no, no. Uh there's you Yubaba, is that the uh the like witch person who like runs the play I don't know there's like a lot of things about this premise and like characters in this that never were appealing to me but I enjoyed it so much and I think it's maybe only like the second or third anime in third 
I've, I've seen Kiki's deliveries. Well, at least in, in terms of like Studio Ghibli. Is it Ghibli or is it Ghibli? I don't know. But um, in terms of that, the third movie that I've seen, I've seen Kiki's Delivery Service. I've seen Castle in the Sky and now Spirited. I say now. It's been like almost a year, but Spirited Away. Yeah, I don't know. I think this was kind of a surprise to me because I'll, I was definitely being biased against it before and, and thinking that it was something that I wasn't going to like. I don't have much to say on this. So next is Peppermint Soda from 1977. Oh, I haven't been. Let's see. Cria Cuervos, of course, is a Spanish language film. Uh, Spirited Away is in Japanese. Um, and then next, Peppermint Soda. This is a French film directed by Diane Curis. I still don't know how to pronounce her name, sorry. I actually recently rewatched this with my movie marathon group because we, uh, for January, our theme was, you know, favorite movies that we watched the year previous. So uh, this is the one that ended up winning of the three that I threw in as recommendations. And this takes place in the 60s and follows Anne and also her sister. I feel like there are some good moments where it follows, um, what's her sister's name? Frederick. She also is, the, the secondary main character, I would say. But Anne is definitely the focus, and it's, again, a coming-of-age story of the two of them. They live with their mother during the school year and then go to their father's house uh, in, in the summertime. And he lives... It seems close to the beach. There's, like, a beach scene in the beginning and a beach scene at the end, and it follows this one school year for the two of them. Again, this is what, hard to describe because there's not that much that happens in terms of events. It's just like following their lives, slice of life situation. Another French film, Le Bonheur from 1965, directed by Agnès Varda. This was my first Varda film and I loved it. Like honestly, the premise isn't that great when I think about it, but I was just like so into it. I think it's a mix of what was happening, but also the storytelling visually plus it's a French film from the 60s. I don't know, there's just an aesthetic that I really like from this time period. And that plus the way that the story was being told was kind of certain jump cuts. It wasn't even necessarily jump cuts. It's kind of like, it would show an image. Uh, this happened like a few times. It would show an image and then it would just show another image and it'd be like the same thing, but like slightly altered. And then the same thing would happen again. But unfortunately, it has to do with this man who starts an affair with this other woman. You, you see the wife kind of like get shoved aside and, and in the picture less as this other woman becomes more a part of the husband's life. And wow, it's so... Literally um, almost everyone that I follow on Letterboxd Gave it a four and a half stars, just like me. Okay, then we have like a sort of odd one that's more like personal taste, I feel like. Um, because I know that this isn't the best, but I really was so into it. So it's Ophelia from 2018, directed by Claire McCarthy. I loved the, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, there is a bit of like ornate aesthetic to the costuming here and to parts of the set. So I was into that. I also just love sort of reworkings or reimaginings of of source material that we're already familiar with, especially if it's something that's like so cemented in pop culture or is like very old or maybe has like a fairy tale, seems like a fairy tale. It really depends on what this source material is in order for me to like actually be on board with it. I'm thinking of like, I love the mini series that was on sci-fi called Neverland, which was like a prequel to Peter Pan. And it's just like, you know, someone just came up with these ideas as why, how Peter Pan came to be Peter Pan and how Captain Hook came to be Captain Hook and things like that. Like I love that sort of thing. Also it's a prequel, so like, already I'm like, oh, this is how these things came to be. Uh, but here, Ophelia, of course, from um, Hamlet by Shakespeare, this is like a kind of reworking of the Shakespeare play and giving us a little bit more insight into things that may have been going on. Maybe things were different. Maybe we didn't have all the information. Maybe Hamlet is a little bit too much about Hamlet and his immature meltdowns and anger. <laughs> I love that Hamlet is like kind of barely in this. It's very much about Ophelia and 
I've never, I don't know, I don't love Hamlet, like, as a play. I definitely prefer other Shakespeare works. I haven't read everything by him, but um, I just really, I really enjoyed this. So I gave it a 4 out of 5 stars, and it's definitely, I mean, even just this image, I can't. I'm such a sucker for certain things. <laughs> Next is another French film, My Night at Mods from 1969, di directed by Eric Homer. I also gave this a 4 out of 5 stars, and this is also kind of slice of life. You're following a main character, played by Jean-Louis Trintignant, who is kind of infatuated this with this one woman that he, like, kind of follows a little bit, <laughs> but then... He meets Maude and becomes really entranced by Maude and like fascinated by her and they have like a very small affair and it really is just like about this moment in his life. This uh, transition between I guess him being single and then him ending up in a solid like relationship with the woman that he was like more infatuated by and was like in love with even though he barely knew her. I don't think this is for everyone. I mean it's rated pretty highly on Letterboxd but I know of like there's some people who just don't get on with the way that Eric Comea's characters are <laughs> like dudes being dudes of the 60s and not really being that respectful to women. Yeah they can be like uh, like other stories of it like what, what is it the La Collectionneuse. Oh my god, those guys are total assholes. They're the worst. I mean, I liked that movie, but I liked these characters at least a bit more, and I liked this premise more, where oh, the guys in La Collectionneuse, was, they were they were just so awful to the main character. I can't, I can't. <laughs> but this one, I, this one was my favorite. I do, I do think that Eric Comeau, his, like, because I read the stories, oh my god, I have this. What am I doing? It's right here. <laughs> Because I read the stories and because I was going through the movies, this ultimately is like a standout of my 2022 year. I didn't end up watching all of these movies yet, but I will continue probably closer to like spring and into the summertime because that's just the vibes it gives. So sorry, I forgot to hold this up, but here, here we are. Next, Tess. From 1979, directed by Roman Polanski, an adaptation of uh, the novel by Thomas Hardy, Tess of the D'Urbervilles. I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. I think that's just because of how much I loved Tess as a book. I'm just going to keep calling it Tess even though the, the full title of the book is Tess of the D'Urbervilles. I've only watched this once so far, so I do think it was that... A situation of me being in my adaptation head, being in that mindset of like comparing the book that I read to this adaptation that I was watching. It's very faithful, but I also think it's so hard. Like you, you need to give adaptations like another watch, no matter what. Even if you loved it, another watch I think is almost necessary, no matter what because then you're less removed from the book, less in that mindset of comparing like, oh, well, this isn't as good as like the images that I had in my head that nothing is going to compare to, <laughs> most likely. It also is quite long. It's 171 minutes, which makes sense. I mean, I'm glad that like not a lot was cut as far as I can remember. So it was a very faithful adaptation and it's also beautiful. Thomas Hardy, writes, you know, his characters live in nature and are like farming characters a lot. They work on farms and Tess is someone who ends up working on a farm. And so that and just like the, na the nature of everything like is very well depicted. It's such a big part of his writing that it's very well depicted in the film as well. I'm trying to like speed up so I'm like not talking about things for forever so that's Tess. I'm sorry, I'm, I feel bad now because I'm not gonna talk, I'm gonna try not to talk about these as much as the other movies that I've already talked about. Ooh, okay, next we have The Stepford Wives from 1975 directed by Brian Forbes. I also gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. The Stepford Wives has just become one of my favorite things um, and is definitely like a standout for 2022. Okay, I'm Favorite things, not like all-time favorite things, but it is like a favorite thing, if that makes sense. Like there's a difference between like all-time favorites and favorites 
of the moment and something that I will recognize as somewhat of a favorite thing as time passes. So this of course is based on the book by Ira Levin called The Stepford Wives and this has to do with Joanna and her husband. They move to Stepford and things are not what they seem. Things seem fine, seem great, seem almost too great. As they continue to live there, as time is passing, she's starting to notice some mm, odd things, inconsistencies, differences, unsettling things as well. And Catherine Ross is so good as Joanna, no one else could be better. Like, I can't think of someone else who, who would have been better cast than Catherine Ross as Joanna. Oh, I also, though, I love Paula Prentice as Bobby. Oh my god, I am not really familiar with Paula Prentice, but she was also, like, a highlight. Oh, I do have a review for this. I didn't look at it at all. Oh, oh my god, it's so good, you guys. All, like, the social commentary. Social commentary just gets me, you know? <laughs> This also made me really appreciate the book even more. The book had much more of an ambiguous ending and this takes it a little step further and I really liked that and I recognized how much of an impact the ambiguous ending had and I ended up increasing my rating of the book from three to four stars because I thought it was like solid good but I was like no this is actually doing a lot. Um, after after I watched the movie and I think this period of time between like reading the book and then a little bit you know maybe a few days between finishing it and then watching the movie and then that time after watching the movie it was like all I could think about I was like Stepford Wives oh my god I was like watching other people's videos on it things like that so definitely a, a favorite from the year okay this one <laughs> This one is probably the most embarrassing thing on this list, I'll admit, but I just like watched this at a good time and it was really enjoyable. It isn't great, I'll admit that, but it's just like this sort of rom-com I watched at a time that I just wanted to watch, not necessarily like mind-numbing things, but nothing too crazy, nothing too action-packed, nothing that was gonna make my brain work overtime. Like something just enjoyable. There are words here that for some reason are not coming to my head. It's Home Again from 2017, directed by Hallie Myers Shire. This one is about Reese Witherspoon who is going through a divorce. She's already gone through a divorce and she uh, is trying to get back out there in the dating pool in a way and ends up, uh, well, ends up like sleeping with this young man who was quite like college age, like early 20s. And he's like so into her though. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and then he and his two friends are trying to like make it in the movie business. They're, they're working on a script. They're trying to get their, their movie made. They like won an award at one of like the film festivals for like a short or something like that. And Reese Witherspoon's dad was like a big director and they kind of like realize like who's how, cause they all end up like staying the night with her just in general. Um, she only like sleeps with the one guy, but they all end up like at her house and kind of like looking at the things around the house and she has like this study where all, all of her father's things are. They realize like, wait, your dad is this person? He, it's, it's him? Her mom kind of convinces her to like be a mentor in a way or like help them kind of like help them in a way. <laughs> you know, they don't have a place to stay. She has like a little pool house that they're, that they can stay in. Uh, she can help with certain advice that, you know, and questions that they may have, things like that. Ultimately, they just like all sort of become like this weird found family though. And I really loved that because she also has like, um, a couple, I think two daughters, I think. Well, she has at least one child and they end up like connecting to the kids. I'm pretty sure there's more than one kid, but they all end up like connecting and I just really loved it, okay? It's cheesy, it's kind of stupid, I don't care. Or you may think it's stupid, but I liked it. <laughs> Next is a documentary called The Woodmans from 2010, directed by Scott Willis. 
I actually didn't click the hearts on this on Letterboxd. I gave it a, a 3.5 out of 5, but it's something that I kind of can't get out of my head. It has to do with the Woodmans who were a family and their most, the most famous of them is probably Francesca who was a young, she became a young um, photographer. Even though her parents were also artists, I think that her legacy because of her art, but also because of her suicide, um, has sort of surpassed the rest of them. Her brother was also an artist and uh, it's just like about, about the Woodmans. And there is a slight focus on Francesca. Just like this story, Francesca, I keep thinking about every once in a while. I did write in my review that I felt I, like in other people's reviews, they kept note, they kept talking about how it seemed like the parents like didn't really care about about them as kids, but I didn't see that necessarily. Yeah, I'm, yeah. My first sentence here is I'm curious how much the editing was like the culprit for Betty and George Woodman coming across coming off as narcissistic because that's what I kept reading that people thought that they were very full of themselves and narcissistic. I did think that to an extent like clearly they cared about themselves and especially themselves as artists. I think that inherently being an artist you're going to compare yourself and your work your abilities to other artists especially if they're working within the same industry like specific industry or medium as you i do have a review on it that you can read and it's just something that stuck out in my head for sure i watched it on the criterion channel i don't know if it's available there now i, I well i'll just click it and see no it is not available then I have Far From the Matting Crowd, the 1998 miniseries. Uh, it's Matt, uh, PBS Masterpiece Classic. This was directed by Nicholas Renton. Honestly, I only gave this a 3 out of 5 stars, but I also rewatched the 1967 um, film adaptation from... That's John Schlesinger, I'm pretty sure. I really love Far From the Matting Crowd. Oh my god, wait. <laughs> this is another Thomas Hardy adaptation. What the heck? I'm just realizing that. Okay. Well, this is based on the novel by Thomas Hardy, same author as Tess. Same author as Tess of the D'Urbervilles. So I watched this and then I, I also rewatched the 67 movie. And I think I also watched another? Is that true? <laughs> oh yeah, duh. The 2015 movie. I'm so dumb. Yeah, the other adaptation, the one that's my favorite, okay. <laughs> I watched all three adaptations. The only adaptations that exist are these three things. I am I do have the 2015 movie. Oh, I have both movies. I have all of them, okay. <laughs> but I'm just showing this one. Yeah, overall, I guess Far From the Madding Crowd was like kind of a favorite and standout thing since I watched slash rewatched all the adaptations. And this one, I don't know, this one just made me think about the characters a little differently. Each each one brings something different to the table and something new for me to think about. This one in particular made me think about Farmer Boldwood even more. I recognize like how, how his role is really such a big part of the story and I think I just get caught up because like Gabriel Oak, okay, Farmer Oak, he is I mean, he's the, he's the, obviously the one that she's going to end up with, right? Like, he's kind of like the fan favorite in a way, especially for Bathsheba. And I'm realizing I'm telling you these things without giving you context. But basically, it's about Bathsheba Everdeen. And she inherits her uncle's farm. And she decides to run it herself instead of getting some man to do it. <laughs> and uh, she also, in her journey of bef before she before she inherited the farm and until the end of the story, I guess, she meets these three men who all uh, fall in love with her to some degree. And so you have, uh, here's that one's Gabriel Oak and he's a farmer who was her neighbor when she lived with her um, other aunt, <laughs> with her aunt because she her parents died. She Yeah, she lives with an aunt and then she inherits her uncle's farm. Now I'm just realizing that's a little confusing um, and I don't know the exact relations there but he was her neighbor before she inherited her uncle's farm uh, and they kind of like had a thing and, and but she didn't want to marry him so she 
declined. She's an independent, free, headstrong young woman and she didn't want to be tied down or stuck in like a woman's role as a wife. And then um, when she inherits her uncle's farm, Farmer Boldwood is a neighbor and one of the more like prominent farmers in the area. He is someone who like runs things. And then you also have Sergeant Troy who is kind of like from the same area but he's also in the army so he's not always there anymore and he's like he comes and goes at times uh, but he is a big major player of course and is into Bathsheba. He personally is my favorite character even though he isn't the best. I don't love him for Bathsheba but I do really like him and so I feel like sometimes I'm like, oh, <laughs> Sergeant Troy. And obviously I do like Gabriel Oak because there really isn't that much to dislike about Gabriel Oak. Let's face it. And then for Farmer Boldwood, he just comes off a little too strong sometimes. I don't know. I, I feel like I truly understood just how, how much of a big deal and how different this was for him to be seen, to be seen by Bathsheba. And I, I talk about it more in my review, but... Uh, Mr. Boldwood was kind of the standout in this adaptation for me. Then also that was another reason I wanted to like rewatch the other adaptations because I just think it's so interesting to compare the way that each character is portrayed, um, the in the way that they're like written in the story, how much a part of the story they are, also the actor's portrayal of them, and you know in comparison to all of that. So that is a standout thing. Um, I can also, I mean, I just think Far From the Madden Crowd is such a, like, rewatchable, re, like, you can consume it, reconsume it over and over again. It's, I don't know, there's just something about it for me. Next is Little Forest from 2018. This is a Korean film directed by Kim Soon Ri? Kim Soon Ri? Rai? Ri. Rai. I'm realizing I've never seen R-Y-E before. I don't think. And this was just so cute. This has to do with a young woman who leaves her, she's like in, at university in the city and she comes back to her small town in the, in the country. It's also kind of like farming land in a way. Um, and she, her mother is not there. Um, her mother left at some point and she just, she needs to get away from the city, needs to get away from school and just be in this like, familiar, peaceful place. And there's a lot of cooking. I think that's that's one of definitely like the reason why it's a standout for me is just she does a lot of cooking and she finds such joy and comfort in cooking. Part of it has to do with like uh, the connection to her mom and her mom being the one who taught her these specific recipes and how to do things and, and how to cook. And she also, this is her first time like not only being back home in a while, but also actually cooking meals for herself instead of just like easy sort of like t TV dinner kind of things where you're just heating something up in the microwave, cup of noodles, you know, all that. She's actually making meals. She's making noodles, perhaps. She's making the meat and marinating it for a long time. She's you know, taking her time and putting the love and passion into the food that she's making. And I just relate to that. <laughs> and I liked seeing it. And it also was just a very like peaceful movie in my opinion. Yeah, there was like some drama because like her friend, uh, there's drama with her mom, but then also um, in her hometown, there's um, a friend, like her best, a couple of best friends that she has. I can see myself also like putting this on every once in a while just to like, it's a, it seems like a really good background film, especially because there isn't like a lot of dialogue at the parts where it's just her in her home cooking. Okay, then we have Gentleman Jack from 2019. I don't know why this is on Letterboxd. Someone explained it to me. I logged this, well, I think I wrote it in my review. I gave it a four and a half out of five stars. <sighs> Peak, I'm telling, this is, I mean, I said this about Bright Star, but this is actually, actually, actually peak costuming. Actually, like literally, if you get anything from Gentleman Jack, this is costuming at its finest. Co period, period piece costuming, okay, specifically. Not only are they 
as historically accurate as they can be, but they represent the characters very well. And you, throughout the two seasons of the show, unfortunately it's been canceled. That's why I asked why is it on Letterboxd when it's not a limited series, it's not a mini series. It's an actual show that got a second season and was going to have a third. It can't cancel, unfortunately. Um, it's It was one of the, I'm pretty sure it's like one of the shows that was hacked when things were changing uh, at with HBO and stuff like that. It's on HBO Max. I think it's still on HBO Max. I actually haven't looked. Wait, they didn't take it off, did they? Because there's been a lot of shows that were, ta were taken off of HBO Max because of like content that they didn't want. Okay, okay, it's still there, thank God. There have been other LGBTQ shows that have been taken off HBO Max because of that sort of content. We can't, we can't get into that, but, um, and this is about Ann Lister, who runs her family's farm. She inherited her father's farm, and she lives with her aunt and uncle and her sister, and she is a lesbian. Her aunt and uncle, like, kind of know this. Her sister kind of, kind of knows this, but it's never something that's ever really said. Um, she's closest definitely to her aunt, though, who she goes to for advice and to talk about the specific things that are happening in her love life. She's a little bit more explicit to her aunt. Um, obviously not in like an overly explicit way. I'm just saying like they're not beating around the bush when it comes to talking about her attraction to other women and her loving other women. And one of the neighbors also named Anne, <laughs> Um, what is, was she away at some point and now they've like moved back in or something like that? She's, she's kind of been away for a bit. She comes back and Ann Lister takes a liking to her and they start a relationship and um, Ann Lister was a real person. These are based on real people. They got married. I mean, it was like a secret sort of marriage, but like legally they were married and they were trying to I mean, live in the in the way that any other married couple would live. And they, like, the first season is very much about the two of them, like, getting together and falling in love. And Anne, I can't think of the other Anne's last name right now. Anne, Anne Walker. She kind of, like, questions this attraction, but honestly, like, not as much as you would think, in, at least in my opinion. It didn't come across like that and so it's about the two of them getting together in the first season and then the second season they are like together and trying to make this relationship more like a marriage not only in name but also like financially also with the property that they own you know if one of if something happens to one of them then they will inherit the other person's property when usually that refers to a man. And of course you have drama that surrounds the farm and surrounding land. This is like around the time of uh, more um, coal, coal, um, oh, like trains are becoming a thing. <laughs> trains are becoming a thing and, and coal is becoming more important. There's also a lot of like other sort of business and like farming stuff that happens. But then there's also societal drama that ensues with like what's ha what's happening between Anne and Anne? Why does it seem like, you know, it's it's kind of an unspoken thing, but there are also other characters who don't fully realize that Anne is a lesbian and has sexual relationships with other women, which in a way is illegal. Technically, it wasn't carried out in the same way. It, di it didn't mean as much as it did for men, but it still is something that was like very much shunned in society and obviously wasn't talked about. And uh, th these are all ba the Gentleman Jack. The series is based kind of on, I know there's a book called Gentleman Jack, which is like nonfiction about Ann Lister. I'm not, I haven't read that. I haven't read anything about Ann Lister, but after finishing the show, I did buy the first volume of her journals, of her diary. There's two volumes of it. And I mean, one of the ways in which we know about, sorry, I've, I've, this is one of the ways in which we know about and Lister's life and like who she really was is because her diaries were found but they're they were in a code I, if I can find an image online I'll like put it up because like it looks crazy you're like what is that and who who needs to write a journal in code 
hmm, what? That clearly that means they're hiding something. And so eventually it was like decoded and it's because she was a lesbian and had sexual relationships with women and her relationship with Ann Walker was like a marriage. And so I, um, yeah, I haven't read the, I haven't read the diaries yet, but I have the first volume and I'm really looking forward to like reading them from, from like her firsthand. Oh my, I didn't even think about that yet. Because, like, it, it's nonfiction, of course, but, like, those are going to be, like, the... I'm going to cry. <laughs> those are going to be, like, the words that Ann Lister wrote. That's crazy. And that's amazing that we have... I mean, even though it was just, like, the early 1800s, 1830... Maybe I should just look this up for, um... Anyway, though, um, I was saying with the costuming, Ann Walker, her costuming starts to change in the second season as she's become closer to Ann Lister and like it's very much her style still and the style of the time but you can see this more masculine influence from Ann Lister um, who dresses as masculine as she can while still dressing like a woman. Like, she doesn't wear, like, dresses, but she still, like, wears her hair in the same way that a woman would because she also doesn't want to be... She wants to be taken seriously. She still wears, like, skirts, uh, but she doesn't wear the very, like, poofy shoulders. You have more of a jutting out at the, um, at the waistline a bit. Uh, anyway, obviously somewhat of a fuller skirt where she doesn't really wear any sort of, um no like crinolines or anything like that to get more of that fuller shape it's just like skirt I mean yes under under undergarments as well okay what am I doing here she lived from 1791 to 1840 okay yeah so I'm remembering 1818 because that's when her journals start it the first volume is from 1818 to I think 34 if I'm not mistaken and then the second volume is to is from some point oh wait that would make sense because she marries Anne in 1930 in 1834 sorry and then she died in 1840 unfortunately she was dubbed the first modern lesbian it's so good highly highly recommend it also there were some turns that were taken by other characters I was like what is happening right now it was truly shocking and oh wait also there's one room in this house, in Ann Walker's house. There's like this sort of morning room, um, morning room, living room. I don't know. It's gorgeous. I, I save pictures of it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll insert them here. But it's just got this beautiful like light sage green color on the walls. And there's like lots of like floral designs. And it just truly is, I want that, I want to live in that room. I love it so much. <laughs> Arabesque from 1966, directed by Stanley Donan, um, who's also the director of Charade, right? Because this gave Charade feels, yeah. It was very similar to Charade in the way that there's like regular man, so to speak, who becomes entangled in this like scheme and conspiracy plot happening uh, that also involves a, a woman who has taste in fashion. <laughs> Um, I wonder actually who did the costumes? Why are costumes went oh of course Yves Saint Laurent and Christian Dior. You know, as you as you do. That makes a lot of sense now, actually. So Arabesque uh stars Gregory Peck, who is so handsome. Oh my god. <laughs> what an attractive man. And Sophia Loren, she was so great. I feel like I haven't seen that much from her, but she stood out in this to me so much. Yeah, I've only seen five movies that she's in and that needs to be changed. I feel like it's best just to go into this, have a good time and exactly what I described, like it's a good mix of action mystery, spy thriller. And then of course, I've been mentioning this a lot lately, Les Vampires from 1915 to 1916. This was a serial. There's 10 episodes and on in my list here, I just have it as Les Vampires as a whole, which is why I get confused when I click this list and it says that I've only watched 19 of the 20 things and that's because I haven't logged this as a full mini series. I logged each episode as I was watching them and this has to do with this group. It's like a criminal organization called Les Vampires and they're not even leader, but they're like muse is Irma Vep. 
and she is such an I feel like you don't even really get to know her but she's so interesting and fascinating to watch and I truly uh, became a little obsessed with Musidora who plays Irma Vap. Uh, there's also on the uh, Olivier Essayes film called Irma Vap with uh, Maggie Chung like playing it's like a they're working on a production of a remake of Les Vampires and there's a supplement on that. I'm pointing because it's over there on my shelf. Uh, there's a supplement on that that is Musidora the Tenth Muse, a documentary about Musidora. So um, I feel like this is a pretty iconic image. French serial about this man who works at a newspaper trying to uncover and have the organization arrested. That didn't really give this much justice, but I was so surprised by this. It was so engaging. I'm kind of hit or miss when it when it comes to silent things. I could be into it or it's just not it's not the right time, it's not working, I don't like it. That could be a mix of things. Obviously timing is significant, but also it could just be the style, it could just be the story, it could be a combination of all of those things. I never thought that there would be a series, a silent series from the 1910s that had me wanting to watch it like a, like a new show that just j that just started airing. And I keep saying that I need to watch more from Louis Fied, who's the director. I haven't done that yet. It will happen. And then lastly, goodness, goodness gracious, All That Jazz from 1979, directed by Bob Fosse. I knew I would enjoy this, but it was still a surprise because I, I thought this would be a little bit more like a traditional musical and it it like is but it isn't. The structure is so interesting because you have this main character who is like a director on Broadway and he's working on his new show but also you have things that are happening in his personal life. So there's this mixture of the show that he's working on but also he is not in good shape in terms of his health and he has a family, he has his work, and he's a workaholic. He should be resting and not working, but he's doing it anyway. All these things are being confronted in this like pseudo musical that's happening in the film. So well done, so well directed. I can't wait to watch this again also. like, I wanna watch it with other people, I feel like. And the performance is really good too. Um, I, ju I just think that you should go into this and watch it. <laughs> and I gave it a four and a half out of five stars. Am I stingy with my five stars? M yes. I was gonna say maybe a little bit, but I, I would say yes. And that's it, okay? Actually, I wanted to see, let's, order, let's do chronological order really quickly. We have 1915, 1965, 1966, 1969, 1975, 1976, 1977, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, 1979, of the movies that I watched from the 70s, there are some really major standouts of things that I just absolutely hated and that are like least favorite films of mine, which is why I consider the 70s to be my least favorite decade. But look at this, we've got how many? One, two, three, four, five, five, which is 25% of this list. And then we have 96, 98, 2001, 2009, 2010, 2015, 20, well, okay, well that's Downton Abbey. So that ran from what, 2011 to 2015, I think? Uh, 2017, 2018, 2018, 2019, that's Gentleman Jack. Wait, Downton Abbey 2010 to 2015. And then Gentleman Jack 2019 to 2022. It just says 2019 on Letterboxd, then The Green Knight in 2021. There we go, there's my list. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching. Of course, this is the video where I'm gonna ask you what were your favorite things that you watched in 2022, what were standouts? Uh, you can even give me like negative standouts, things that were just like so awful that you can't get them out of your mind. <laughs> but uh, of course, preferably, I would like your favorite things standouts in the way that they made an impact on you positively, uh, were very well done, were just things that appealed to you and your liking. 
finally. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.